started here. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Jeremy Fricky. I'm Education Director at Tri Faith Initiative, and you are here for Abraham's Whiteboard. Um, let me share my screen here. Let's see. All right. So uh, today's is, is about art, um, how faith becomes art and art becomes faith. And, and we're going to be talking about sort of that intersection, that intermingling uh, between art and religion. Um, you know, obviously, there's a lot that could be gone over uh, with art and religion. Um, but today, we're just going to be able to focus on a few different things. Um, we're going to be going over some announcements first. And then um, I'll kind of give a grand chronology of art and religion, kind of to, to get a context of how uh, these two things sort of developed uh, alongside each other, um, as well as some of the scriptural and cultural influences. Um, and then Amanda is actually going to be uh, talking about uh, some of the symbols in religious art and, and leading a bit of a discussion about um, how we see art uh, from our own different perspectives in different uh, modes and methods. Um, then we'll end some reminder with some reminders and uh, we'll provide some resources if you're interested in learning more. Um, so again, you know, this is, this is an overview. You know, I, we have 60 to 90 minutes today and uh, talking about religion and art, I mean, there's thousands of years of, um, of art with religion that we can go over. Um, I'm going to really be trying to give, give enough of an overview to kind of learn what to look into. Um, we, we don't wanna define art today per se, uh, but we will be excluding music and performance art. Um, I, I think we're really hoping that uh, in the future, Abraham's whiteboard will be able to come back to music and performance art so that they can have their own um, uh, their own class. So I, I do want to start off with a question and, and you can feel free to answer in the chat or verbally. Uh, what do you think of when you think about religious art? You know, do you think of certain art pieces? Do you think of new ideas? Um, what do you think of when you think about religious art? I think of the Vatican museums and the Sistine Chapel and I don't know, just some El Greco stuff and mm -hmm. you know, some pretty traditional types of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think about architecture a lot in particular. Okay, yeah, those are good. I think about stained glass windows Mm hmm that's true yeah so I mean art can be so many things um, and you know again today we're mostly going to be looking at um, what painting sculptures and uh, what you might call like practical art or and architecture um, kind of the art that is also uh, formed but um, for specific purposes so uh, let's start off with kind of really trying to understand the grand scheme of things when it comes to how art and religion develop with each other over time. Um, so what I'm really going to be using for this is um, a, uh, an essay called Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction. It's written by Walter Benjamin. And um, just to give a little background to Walter Benjamin, he was a uh, German Jewish uh, scholar and artist. And uh, he grew up in Germany and uh, during the um, Nazi rise to power, he moved to France. And then eventually he uh, found that he was in severe danger in France also. Uh, so he was invited to come to Spain uh, and he went with a, a group of people, a group of different academics that were invited um, by some Spanish academics. And um, when they got to the border, uh, the Spanish uh, border guard said, no, you cannot cross. 
Uh, this is, you know, these are government orders. People cannot cross this border. And um, Walter Benjamin knew that if he went back, that he would be killed. So he ended up uh, committing suicide by morphine overdose. But this is not the end of the story uh, because he, he actually goes on, or not he goes on, uh, the, the group goes on to the Spanish border again. And uh, the border guards are so concerned about um, this man who was willing to take his own life in the context of just being turned away at the border that they allowed the rest of them to pass. Um, so with, with his passing, uh, others were able to uh, find some safety. So again, you know, he is a scholar and an artist. He, he does a lot with art. He also looks a lot at politics. A lot of it is influenced a little bit by um, sort of the modernization of uh, particularly Germany, um, both with politics and art. So <clears throat> before I go here, um, one other thing to add is that he, he suggests that we start at the very beginning, you know, when does what art and religion, um, when do those arrive in uh, civilization, in human society? And he really wants to push that the, the original use of art or ritual were one and the same. Okay, so, so when you create a piece, especially thousands of years ago and maybe still today, um, art was done for the sake of doing art and ritual was done for the sake of doing ritual. And those two things are often the same thing. So for example, with this, uh, this top picture, we have um, a, basically a sand painting. Um, this is a Navajo sand painting. And uh, the tradition with that is that uh, the sand is laid for ritual reasons, you know, and within the next few days, the sand just blows away, right? But that the image that is created is sort of carried to, um, to deities or uh, spirits or um, you know, other religious figures. So that art is not permanent, right? It's, it's done for the sake of the ritual and it's done for the sake of the art. And those things are very difficult to separate. Um, in, the, in the bottom left here, we also have the Sukkot or the Sukkah right? Sukkah for Sukkot. Um, and, and a lot of this art also has some overlap where we have a, uh, a ritual to create the Sukkah, which is um, sort of a, a shelter, uh, a small shelter. And it's uh, made kind of for the purpose of ritual and art um, in conjunction with each other. So these things are very hard to separate, especially in the early days of both religion and art. And they wouldn't, they probably wouldn't have been understood as separate things, you know. So, but eventually we, we start to see um, religion be separated from other aspects of life. And if you were at the, uh, what is religion? Abraham's whiteboard. I talked a little bit about how um, really, the concept of religion as a separate thing uh, came about mostly from early Christianity and was kind of extrapolated on with Islam as well, um, that religion being separate from your ethnic group or your cultural group, um, that's what I'm talking about. So um, they, they slowly become their own categories of action. You know, you continue to have art pieces, but they're not necessarily always tied to ritual anymore because that ritual is its own thing now. It is part of religion. <clears throat> but um, the really key piece that, um, that Walter Benjamin argues 
is that we are changing both the purpose of art and religion with the idea of mass production. Okay, so when we're talking about um, today, okay, a painter paints something and they create a, uh, you know, they put it on the canvas. And then you often have a professional photographer or some kind of scanning device that, that saves that image so that it can be printed for many others. And that's totally different than how art or ritual would have been understood even a couple hundred years ago. Um, it's not that it hasn't been that long that mass production has existed. <clears throat> so the purpose of art especially has changed in the last couple hundred years um, to really focus on a spreading a single idea among many people. So, you know, and I don't use this term negatively, but um, you might call it propaganda, where uh, you have a mass communication of a single message um, across many. Now, uh, Walter Benjamin also argues that um, the original is always going to be the closest to reality for the author because the the further you get from the original the art starts to take its own life um, so we look at things like the internet's memes right where most of those pictures weren't made for memes right they were fam silly family photos or um, kind of a, a weird exchange in a TV show or something, and they, they lose all context, but that art uh, continues to live on. It just uh, does change what that original message was in, intended to be. Does that make sense? I know that was a lot of information in a very short time. Does anybody have any questions about that before uh, we move to the next section? I hope that wasn't too dry. I have a thought. This is Jean mm -hmm. in Minneapolis. When, if you've created something, whatever kind of art it is, paint, drawing, texture, fabric, there's, it comes from within you somehow. It's a creation that had meaning to you. It came out in some form, but it came from you. And sometimes you share it with another person or two people or a group. But as soon as it's mass produced and it's sent out in bulk to a lot of people, it's lost its meaning. It already has a different meaning anyway. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think that's a very good point. You know, and, and for a long time, people have shared art with their communities. Um, but it's, it's definitely true, like what you're saying, where um, it's, it's not necessarily bad that, you know, art is mass reproduced. It just has changed what it is, right? Um, you're, in some ways, we're able to mass communicate ideas and, and creativity, but we also do lose something in that process. Um, it's just part of how things change, I suppose. Jeremy, I'm curious, um, there's a lot written about when the uh, Bible was mass produced and how that changed people's um, understanding of that. And so where's the intersection of the mass production of art to the mass production of the scripture? I think that's a good point. Um, no, I haven't really thought about it that much, honestly, but um, but I think that there's there's no doubt that uh, the value placed upon uh, scriptures is very different today than it was um, again a few hundred years ago before it could be mass produced. Um, things like a you know just a, a Bible, for example, you know anyone can get one for free somewhere, right? It's laying around everywhere. You can go to your hotel and grab one or, you know, whatever. Um, that just would not have been the case. They, it would be very expensive and very difficult to get your own copy of one uh, even 500 years ago. Um, so that place is a different value. Again, that doesn't mean it's always bad, but it does change what 
scripture is and what it means to people when uh, when it is so readily available and so easy to share. I would add to that. I think um, digital access changes things again. So our ability to like um, search for a certain word in a digital um, example of a biblical text is change, changes our understanding of the text. And I would imagine that the um, the art world is really impacted by the technology also related to religious art. Yeah, there's no doubt that um, that that's the ultimate mass production is the ability to produce without producing anymore, right? That anyone who wishes to have access has access for free in front of them without carrying any, anything, you know, you, you have it like that. And again, not, I, I, I want to be very clear that often when people hear mass production and propaganda and things like that, they think of it in a negative way. I, I want to more uh, bring out that there's both benefits and drawbacks to, to these changes. Yeah. Jeremy, can I um, add a point real quick? Yeah. Um, when I think about the mass production of art, uh, I, I, I see both the positive and the negative. And so for myself as a creative person who does paintings and art um, and my friends wanting to have you know those paintings once I finished them but they're so close and so dear to me that I still want them <laughs> right and so um, so I look towards the ability to mass produce not necessarily mass produce but to replicate things through online services that allow pe more people to access my art that does have religious undertones and does have messaging to it. Um, so I view that as a point of accessibility. Um, and I think that a lot of artists are starting to take advantage of that. Um, and then uh, in multiple ways, because <laughs> also just thinking about revenue, right? If you have one piece of original art that you can sell for $1,000, right? Then you get that one $1,000 paycheck. But then if you can replicate more pieces, then that's, that's where your created creativity and your art becomes your livelihood. And there's positives and negatives to that as well. Right. Um, right. So I, I guess I, um, I tend to lean a little bit based off of our society that mass production is good. However, also um, acutely aware of the alienation between the artist and then the consumer at that point. Right, right. I think those are great points. You, you can also, if, uh, if, if you see the original work of art, it's not the same thing when you see a copy. And, and so there's a, a personal, uh, more of a personal contact, I guess, with the art or possibly the artist, uh, if you see the original. Um, and, and copies are nice because we can't all see everything, but, but the originals have a, a kind of life that, that copies usually don't have. Mm -hmm. And, and I, you know, we just maybe think to yourself also about how does, how does that idea affect how we think about our rituals and our uh, religious lives, you know? The, the whole kind of dichotomy between mass production and that um, momentary experience, you know, that, that both can be good, but how does that play in, in your own life? Um, so I'm going to, to move on to the next section a little bit, which I'm just going to talk about some of the most influential, um, influential pieces of uh, particularly the A Abrahamic traditions uh, when it comes to art. Um, so, so firstly, we're going to be talking a little bit about aniconism. Uh, so that is the ban on depictions of animals or humans. Uh, this is a popular, uh, well, m maybe not popular. It is a um, an important belief in much of Abrahamic religion. Um, and in some ways has changed over time or depends on the, the sect or the, the philosophy, et cetera. Um, but th this is kind of behind uh, some of the choices that are made 
with Abrahamic art um, in many ways. We'll get to some of the reasons why, um, why art still exists at a certain point. Um, but just to give a couple examples of kind of where this comes from or some, some rules about art with uh, the Hebrew Bible, I'm just going to read a couple of verses here. Um, so in Exodus 24a, uh, or 4 to 5a, I mean, um, that is, uh, you shall make no carved likeness or graven image and uh, no image of what is in the heavens above or what is on the earth below or what is in the waters beneath the earth. Uh, you shall not bow to them and you shall not worship them for I am the Lord your God, a jealous God. Um, and then also a related uh, one is uh, shortly after there's an explanation of how to build an altar. Um, and specifically, should you make me an altar of stones, you shall not build them of hewn stones or cut stones. Uh, for your sword, you would brandish over it and profane it. Um, so uh, there's a couple things there. It's very important to see that uh, God has a prohibition against the cutting of stones for the altar uh, that has been e extrapolated to be understood as um, um, basically the idea would be that Abraham would have created an altar by basically picking up rocks as they were, putting them in a pile um, and others, other uh, prophets as well. Um, graven image um, has been interpreted different ways, but mostly uh, as it pertains to statues or um, idols, uh, particularly those to be worshiped. Um, but depending on who you talk to, it could be different. Um, so, um, and then let's, let's also quickly talk about the golden calf, which is probably the other uh, key piece. Um, and this story is both in uh, Exodus and the Quran, and they're really close. Um, and I'm not going to read them, but I'll kind of go through a quick um, overview of the story. So uh, the basic idea is that uh, when Moses is going up uh, to the mountain to receive the commandments, um, the, the people uh, and Aaron are left uh, down on the hillside, basically. And <clears throat> the, the people are um, getting kind of frustrated and uh, they really want um, to have a, a statue made. Um, and they, they melt the gold with Aaron and uh, create a golden ox or golden calf. And they say that this golden calf is is the Lord who took us out of Israel or out of Egypt. Um, and then eventually Moses comes down and then there's the famous uh, scene from the Ten Commandments uh, where the, um, the tablets are uh, destroyed at that point. And then eventually uh, Moses has to get another set. But so there's a couple things to point out about this story really quick. One is there are two main ways to interpret the golden calf. One is that they made a statue of a different God, tried to revive their, um, their old religion. And they, uh, they worshiped an old God and, and claimed that um, this old God uh, this old God was the one that helped them. Um, and then the alternative is that uh, this golden ox was an, attempted to be a representation of God. And um, most, most, uh, uh, most Jewish people and uh, most Muslim people do avoid depicting God in that kind of, in that kind of way um, most of the time. And Either way, you know, uh, the the icon or the um, or the depiction of God, 
the main difference between the Hebrew Bible and the Quran with this is that in the Quran, Aaron is not at fault. Um, in, in the Hebrew Bible, Aaron participates in, um, in creating the statue in the Quran, he does not. All right. And then lastly, with the, um, um, particularly in, in Islam, uh, so when Muhammad comes to Mecca uh, during his story, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but it's important to, uh, to him, to God, to, uh, to destroy the statues, the idols that were housed at Mecca. So um, this, is, this is a common theme. Uh, throughout much of Abrahamic tradition historically. Um, but art is also a very, uh, um, a very it, it's a very human experience and, and people tend to find ways to, uh, to try to bring all parts of their identity together. Um, and uh, I know after I talk about this last piece, I'm sorry about the lewdness here, uh, but um, uh, Amanda will, will go into more detail about some of those ways that people um, find that. So the last piece that I want to talk about is Hellenization, which has been highly influential on Christianity in particular, but also um, on Judaism to a slightly lesser extent. Um, so Hellenization is uh, the, the time period actually um, near the turn of the era, you know, like um, up to 30 BC, where uh, in the Roman Empire, we have a, a particular strategy to adopt um, various cultures. Okay, so, so you have this, this overarching empire and when they were to colonize or take over different areas, they would um, they would allow them to retain some level of their religion, of their culture, um, if they were to kind of um, uh, do some of the most important practices for Rome or Greece. <clears throat> so. Greco-Roman art is often, it's very obvious, you know, highly detailed, very, uh, very based around uh, the human figure, uh, many, many sculptures. And uh, on the left here, we have, um, I believe it's Michelangelo's uh, nude Christ. And on the right here, we have uh, Hercules, um, the Farnese Hercules, I, I believe. Um, and I, I want to point out a couple of things here that are that are very interesting um, when it comes to understanding how people have sort of religious dialogue through art. Um, we we see uh, what, what I mean. What do we see that's uh, similar uh, between these two? Um, would anyone like to point out? They're posing. They're posing. <laughs> yep. Yeah. 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 For sure. They're both kind of. Um, they look like they might be resting a little bit uh, from work. Any other th things to note here? I guess you could call Jesus resting on the cross work. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, Yeah, I think for the Greeks, it was um, really important to show masculinity of sorts. Okay. Um, and so that has to do with the the pose depicting Jesus uh, with muscular tone, uh, genitalia, all of that. That was um, pretty important to the Greeks. Right, right. Um, I mean, even like the, it's, it's, fascinating to me because I mean even the clothes right they're both they're both carrying uh, I mean on uh, the right uh, it's the height of the Nemean lion and on the 
left it's the robes of Christ. And um, I mean, I don't know for sure here, but to me, the left even reminds me a little bit of, I mean, it's a rope, right? Um, it reminds me of actually the, the whip that Jesus uses. Um, Hercules here is leaning on um, his club. So, and then there's the beards. I mean, there's multiple levels to this. Um, we definitely also see a, a deep importance to, to see themselves a little bit in, in their uh, religious figures. And so Hellenization really, just to kind of bring it together here. So Hellenization um, shows that they, it's probably mostly Christian from Greek at this point in art history, but um, that they were willing to have some level of trade uh, culturally um, to, to be able to speak to different groups of people. Um, you know, this, I mean, on its face is um, a graven image, right? Um, but that there's, there's certain things about Greco-Roman culture that uh, influence things like philosophy, right? So we have a different approach to what graven image is because also of Hellenization. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of that. And, and we'll see that throughout time of a wide variety of religions um, that, you know, when, when multiple cultures come into contact with one another, they uh, learn from each other. They, they often will um, adopt certain pieces to be able to represent themselves or be able to speak to the other group um, in a better way. Um, all right, so um, does anyone have any questions about anything I've gone over? Um, and then we will be moving on to um, Amanda with some discussion around symboli specific symbolism within um, our traditions. I know that was like the fastest uh, religious art history thing ever, but um, I hope I hope that gives a little bit of background. Yeah, and if you have any questions as we get into this next part, feel free to either put them in the chat or um, to speak up, and Jeremy and I will, as best we can, help to answer those or have some discussion around those points. So I am now going to can share. I yeah. I just want I just want to uh, maybe offer a different kind of insight into the role of Aaron with the golden calf, because uh, he is really not blamed by most of the commentators, because he never lost a priest with, as a result of doing it. So he is forever blessed in a special covenant of peace, which is in the story of Pinchas where Aaron is actually known as a person who was pursuing peace. And that's why he was helping to prevent the Israelites of going back to Egypt because Moses was very, very late to come to the meeting. That's all. Right, right. Um, the, thank you. That, yeah, thank you for adding to that. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the key... The, the key main difference between the um, the Quran and Hebrew Bible story about that is just that um, Aaron is not involved at all with that process. In, it's interesting. In the Quran, yeah. Um, he's, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a little more explicit about that. Yeah. Now, if I can add, um, yep. yeah, on Aaron's role, uh, Moses, of course, you know, went up to Mount Sinai. Um, so Aaron was left in charge. Um, uh, let's see where it had here. In verse 90, Aaron had indeed told them earlier, Oh, my people, you are being only misled with this. Surely your Lord is a Rahman. So follow me and obey my command. They said, so as long as Moses does not come back. We are not going to give it up and we will, we will remain devoted to it. Um, and then Moses had come down 
you know, oh, Aaron, when you saw that they had gone astray, what hindered you? And um, there was a tugging of hair, hair between the two brothers. Oh, son of my mother, Aaron cried, do not pull me by my beard or my hair. I was really afraid you may say that I had created a rift among the children of Israel and did not pay heed to your command. So he was not at fault. He was uh, trying to, you know, dissuade them from doing that. So. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now we're going to move on to some looking at some more art um, and this part is going to be I want your guys's feedback I want to know what you see in the art um, if it's different what does the certain symbols mean to you do they have re a religious meaning or not do you see something in the art that um, maybe doesn't spring out as religious, but then you think about it and it is, or just is to you personally. So that's um, kind of helping to, to frame what we're gonna be doing next. So I will share my screen as well. Um, let me see, here we go. And you should be able to see that. Let me move some things around. We're gonna present. And so we're going to be looking at religious symbolism in art. And so I started off with some, uh, just some pieces that we see um, that we're kind of familiar with, the styles, what they're depicting, um, uh, just to kind of begin. So what are re religious symbols in the first place? And these questions are more for you. I don't want to, um, I don't want to have to lead you guys anywhere on these. This is, this is about you and your, your beliefs. And so what are religious symbols? Where do they come from? And what do they mean uh, to you? Does anybody want to start? I'm going to call on Rabbi Azrael real quick and ask if you could explain the Hamsa or Hand of Fatima. You're on mute. Tell him again. Yeah, still on mute. Let's see, um, there um, we go. I think uh, I, would, I would prefer if you can ask one of our Muslim friends to go first with the Hamsa. I, Abdul, um, <laughs> I'm trying to see if there's anybody else. Uh, Jeremy, can you see on the screen? No, I think I'm the only one. I don't know. <laughs> uh, God, hand of Fatima. Hmm. Um, I really don't know, and I say this because, you know, Fatima, okay, you have Our Lady of Fatima, okay, the city in Portugal. Mm -hmm. You have Fatima, the daughter of the prophet, Muhammad, mm -hmm. peace be upon him. Um, I know in Islam, um, images of prophets, um, you know, we cannot, you know, show them, obviously. Um, hands of, okay, are usually, you know, whited out or, you know, phased out or clouded out. Now, the hand of Fatma is that. Uh, directly related to the prophet's daughter or the hand of Fatima? Is that related to the Virgin Mary's hand at Fatima? Uh, that I really do not know. Is it a combination of both? I don't know. So. The, reason, uh, the reason I defer that question to you <laughs> is because we find this only after the Spanish Inquisition. So after, I mean, definitely you mentioned Portugal. Mm -hmm. Portugal is very close to Spain. We only discovered the Hamsa in Judaism 
after the experience in Spain as a result of the relationship that Jews had with Muslims in Spain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and another point on that is that um, it is also sometimes referred to the hand of Mary. So I think that Abdul, that connection with um, Fatima and Mary, those two figures, um, is part of that connection. But generally, uh, my understanding of the Hamsa is that it, it's a symbol of um, protection and health and luck. Um, I, it's a symbol that I personally I, uh, connect to. Um, and so I'm actually wearing my Hamsa ne necklace right now um, that was gifted to me from a friend. She just happened to see it in a flea market in LA and she said, that's for Amanda. And so um, that's something that I've always worn um, for kind of like my, my own personal um, belief in our shared history as Jews, Christians, and Muslims. It's used as an, it's used as an amulet mm -hmm. to protect it from also evil spirits. Yep. And we, we find this uh, with the uh, Jews that immigrated from Arab countries to Israel. They are the one that really brought it in and made it uh, maybe and, made it famous. And Sephardic Jews as well, would you say? Yeah, 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 yep. Um, that Spain area. And then, um, well, actually, I should ask: Does anybody else have anything to say about symbols in general? What are religious symbols to you? I feel like they. They're kind of like, like to dumb it down, it's kind of like a logo for the religion. Like if, when you see it, like even if you're not religious, like especially like the cross is like one of the most well-known symbols in like the world. Um, you know, you see it, you, <clears throat> even if it doesn't really mean anything to you personally, you know, like what it means like as a whole or like what it means to specific people, you know. Um, I know the, the Star of David, is easily recognized. I see it a lot. I see, um, I didn't know the, 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 the name of that hand, but I've seen a lot of jewelry with um, that hand. I think it's really pretty. Um, and, you know, I feel like if anybody like believes that like, you know, their, their specific symbol or amulet or whatever has the powers they want it to have, like it can, like if you believe hard enough, it can do special things for you, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and so that's why I put at the bottom the symbols of Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, because those are um, the symbols that we probably think of the most um, and the quickest, or um, in interfaith work, we've all seen the coexist bumper sticker that is used out of different religious symbols that we can all recognize, right? So that's how you know, like, they're saying all religions should coexist, right? Um, uh, one of the things I was just thinking about when you said that, and sorry, I didn't, I, I don't know who said the last comment, um, but it's Catherine, you, hi, Catherine, hi. Um, but you, when you were talking about the, the Hamza or Hand of Fatima, um, mm -hmm. it reminded me that there is a lot of people using that symbol now, and it brought me back to the point that Jeremy made earlier about mass production. So mm -hmm. when the element is so, is mass produced so much, and when I was talking about the alienation from the artist or from the meaning to the, the consumer, um, I think something like the Hamsa is one of those things that has happened that has made it so that it, more people uh, don't know the history or the, some of the traditional symbolism behind it and it's been commodified. Um, Okay. Anybody else? I'm, I'm not clear about the last remark. If we can expand on that. Yeah, so we what know is, that... What is the connection between the, the Star of David and the Holocaust? For, this is Wendy. For, for me, the use of the Star of David on people's arms in order to mark them as a Jew in a negative way, um, holds a, for me, holds a negative 
emotion that I choose not to mark myself by wearing a Jewish star. Um, I, I have a Hamza on right this minute, but I, I, I just choose not to wear um, a Jewish star or to have that symbolism in my home because it feels, because I feel negative energy from it. Uh -huh. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. The, yeah, star of, the Star of David uh, started as a belief that the Jewish star was on the shield of King David. So that was the way King David protected himself. But we are discovering actually that that symbol started in the 15th century as a marker for Jewish cemetery lots. So it was uh -huh. more an identification of a, Jew a Jewish burial site rather than anything that has to do with King David. Mm -hmm. And that brings up a, a really good point about symbols and identity, um, which for a plug for my uh, program next week about this, we'll probably dive into this a little bit more, is that generationally too, there's a different feeling of, amongst people about whether or not they wear a religious symbol, right? Because some people do have that negative association with it based off of their history or their family's history, while other people want to reclaim symbols, um, particularly around the Holocaust. I have seen a lot of people trying to um, say like, um, yeah, I am part of that marginalized group. Am I gonna wear a yellow Star of David on my shirt? No, but I am gonna start wearing a Star of David. And that's valid as well as Wendy's um, relationship with the Star of David. So um, I think that that identity piece is really important when we start looking at symbols. And also thank you, Rabbi, for pointing out something in the chat because I could not see the chat. So I did not know that that was happening. So I appreciate that. I think some, some symbols can lead to death. There were two French Jews that were killed mm -hmm. as a result of being followed. Uh, they were wearing kippah. Kippah yep. is also a symbol, the one, the head covering. Mm -hmm. So we, we need to be careful sometimes of where are we walking with what symbols. Absolutely. Hi, this is Carrie Pill, and this kind of relates to both what Wendy said and, and what someone said about the scapulas. As a Roman Catholic, I mean, we have so many symbols and accoutrements like rosaries and scapulas and crosses and things. And I always feel a little worried that it goes back to the to the calf and idolatry that, you know, it's so easy for it to fall into what to me feels like um, just superstition. Um, I understand that a lot of people have very devout religious feelings, but I just think that it's, um, it's so easy to say, you know, I mean, God knows I have prayed to St. Anthony when I've lost something and it always feels great when I find it. But I, um, I worry about sometimes um, superficiality related to things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of brings us into the next uh, set of questions. So are symbols literal representation of religious text or religious belief? Um, and what about the mystical? So you hit on that. And then Cynthia also in the chat um, talked about um, the mystical. So if either of you'd like to expand upon what you were thinking there, that'd be awesome. If not, I will move on to looking at some of the um, mystical art that I found while we were doing our research. So these are three pieces. Um, and they're all from people, artists who identify as mystics in their traditions. So um, whichever one 
calls out to you if you wanted to kind of see explain any of the symbolism that you see in it and what you think that the particular picture is and then we'll once we're done discussing this I'll um, show you what the names of the pieces and the artists who they are once again as a Catholic Christian I look at the picture of Jesus and it looks like uh, the tomb has been opened up. You see sort of like a, a covering that's been uncovered. Who was there first? The women. Where are they? Not in this mm -hmm. picture. You're 100% correct. <laughs> yep. Um, I'm, I'm, oh, this is Cynthia. I don't think the women are there yet because this is just when he's coming up. But what bothers me is his yellow hair. <laughs> I'm interested in why you think it's Jesus. That's a good point. <laughs> just, just one. I mean, I, I have a few reasons, but I'm just wondering if it. Um, the first it, thing that really kind of shows it, it is could how be the he's... ascension, rather, uh, with the uh, uh, on the transfiguration. It's not white, but it it would certainly fit with with transfiguration. I don't know. Where's that? why is there what looks like the lid of a casket coming off if it's the transfiguration? You, you've mm. got the, the three disciples, which would fit with that. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think there was somebody else who was trying to get a comment and- Yeah. Um, yeah. What I notice a lot specifically about like art of Jesus is how he's like mostly depicted as like a white man when he <laughs> most definitely wasn't <laughs> um like especially in that picture he's got like blonde hair he's like albino white almost like he lived in like palestine like he wouldn't be <laughs> caucasian <laughs> right which is yeah. a lot of things like it pops up a lot in art like he's very whitewashed it's very whitewashed in the art you know mm-hmm do you mind if um, I comment really quick, Amanda? Yeah, that comment from Summer or Catherine. I, no, I wanted to read a comment from the oh, chat sorry. real quick. Um, oh, no, I, I was just going to add really quick that um, we'll, we'll plan to do actually a separate program um, in the future here that, that actually goes into more detail about depictions of Jesus across cultures. Um, just because uh, that's a that's something that's particular um, to Christianity, um, kind of how Jesus became white um, mm -hmm. as a program. So um, that'll be in the future, though. So sorry, All right, go on. Um, you're fine. Um, and then Summer put in a really good uh, comment in in contrast to what uh, Catherine had just said. And Summer says, I grew up Christian, but now I have a very different belief system, but I didn't see Jesus at first. Um, she saw an all seeing being, and it looks like eyes in the hands rising from darkness, seeing all darkness and light. Um, so so the stigmata where he was nailed to the cross. Yep. So yes. And we're also looking at a mystical interpretation of whatever the scene is, right? We'll, we'll get to that in a second. So, um, so whatever Summer is seeing into that and into the stigmata from a literal point of view may very well be what the artist intended us to see. Um, Mm. The piece on the right uh, on the right encourages meditation and personal introspective. That is very interesting. I'm really excited excited to like unveil what these are to you guys. Um, does anybody have something to say about the one in the middle? Yeah, I th I think it's uh, either Persian or Mughal. In, uh, um, I know it's not a prophet, but probably a, a mystic. Uh, um, yeah, either Persian or or Mogul. Okay. I think. Okay. Sufi. Well, yeah, yeah, obviously with uh, with the uh, yeah mystic, yeah, with the cone head. I mean the cone. <laughs> <hat>. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm interested. 
did I mean, which yeah. is it? Right? So yeah. it could be a whirling dervish without whirling. <laughs> <laughs> Not being of that Persian tradition, I'm thinking as I look at it that it's somebody who is cold and they were walking <laughs> in the desert and they didn't realize they'd end up in a very cold part of the desert. So I'm <laughs> in a very different world on this one. <laughs> I mean, we do have snow on the ground, so I can see how you made that connection. <laughs> Um, does anybody else have any uh, more comments? As Bob was saying um, in the chat, I think we both really looked at the art on the right hand side um, and something about it did feel very Jewish mystic to us um, in a way of like the blending of the colors and the patterns, not only Kind of symbolizing what I would consider like a blending of maybe cultures and peoples, but also of just identity in general and trying to find your way in the diaspora of Judaism. So I'm really interested to figure out more about this piece. <laughs> cool. Um, and I, I don't know the symbolism of the one on the right, but as a quilter, I know those are flying geese and I know which direction you think the geese are going depends on which color you're looking at. Perspective changes constantly if you change your focus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's one of the best things about art, I think. Okay, so are religious symbols accessible to everybody for interpretation? And does that interpretation have to be the same? I think we just demonstrated from that conversation that it doesn't, it, it isn't necessarily, right? And yes, we're looking at, um, at pieces that were made by people who describe themselves as mystics, but we also heard people give some literal interpretations of the symbols that they saw. So yes, this is the resurrection of Jesus. This is a dervish. Um, and then this is um, the 100 sounds of the shofar. So um, the, I thought they were all really beautiful in their own unique ways and they're coming from different time periods. Um, who, is the, who is the artist of the shofar? The um, Avraham Le, Leo Winthal, L-O-E-W-E-N-T-H-A-L. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, Yep, and Jeremy, if you want to include uh, some of the art pieces in your recap, we can link all the artists as well. Um, of course. But yeah. Uh, does anybody have any comments about the accessibility to uh, religious symbolism? I feel like it's pretty accessible to like anybody really with an internet access. Um, and then like for interpretation, like mm -hmm. everybody's gonna interpret it like differently, at least a little bit, like, cause it's art. No one really knows the true meaning of it since there's no words on it. Right. And once again, that goes back to the, I keep, I, I, I don't know why this piece is hitting on me so much, Jeremy, the, the piece about mass production. I think it's because you said that it can be both good and bad. Um, and so that interpretation if we were looking at the original of this and we could see the different brush strokes, um, textures and things like that, that maybe we would have a different connection and we would see different things within that art. Um. Amanda, Amanda? Yeah. When, could you re, uh, say, repeat your question about accessibility? Because I went in a whole different direction. I want to know- Well, what, what direction did you go into? <laughs> Well, art is accessible, but if I'm as a person don't have a sense of an inner, I guess, then no art is accessible, really. It's just out there. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like what is in the eye of the beholder comment? Mm -hmm. What do I bring with an interior life to whatever I'm looking at? Exactly. Sort of yeah. those pictures that have the vase in the faces, you know, or something. It's like I bring something to whatever art's in front of me but I, I agree that the web having access to internet can bring us to a lot more things to look at but what do i bring to it exactly yeah um it's uh you know art is subjective 
we hear that all the time. It might be for some artists that it's objective and they know exactly what it is. But once that piece is out of your hands as an artist, it becomes subjective for the people who view it. Um, okay, so I wanted to show some photos of how art and symbols have been used in different um, spaces. So this is a, uh, a, copy of the Hebrew Bible from 1366. This is one of the, oh, they believe that it was um, an owner of this particular uh, Bible. This photo is from the Met. Uh, so uh, they have pretty extensive history on these pieces, but you can see how they even use the Hebrew as art. And that is very similar to how calligraphy is also used as art in Islam as well as some different um, symbolism. So it looks on the right side that there is potentially some vines and some flowers or grapes or berries of some sort maybe. Um, and you can, yeah, I just, I think that this is one of those really beautiful pieces that um, incorporates the actual text into the art. And then another um, form of art uh, within Judaism that is like a ritual and practice um, is uh, the ketubah um, or, uh, or the marriage contract that Jews uh, make when they get married. And I may have done that because I just got married. So, um, but you can also see that the one on the left is more ornate, right? So they have a lot, um, more art in it and then the one on the right tense is um just hebrew but once again they use the hebrew in an artistic way to form borders and shapes and um something beyond just the words that are part of the marriage contract question here was that were those supposed to be in the shape of a tablet yeah yeah. Early early Keto both are many of them are in the shape of the uh, of of a covenant. It's like a covenant covenantal marriage. Mm -hmm. And I've seen a lot of modern ones that um, that still do that shape, but most modern ones that um, you can buy off of shops like Etsy or to get personalized, they they come in any shape or size now um yeah but you have to be you have to be careful with those because many times they there is the trans translation does not reflect the hebrew and then Correct. if you one day need to defend the fact that you you go to israel and you're, you're jewish uh be careful because some of the rabbinic courts will cancel your wedding because the text is not the right Correct. text. Correct, right. And the, like the formal more, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the more formal orthodox ones do have to have that specific wording. And, oh. uh, yeah. and if they don't, you're kind of out of luck. You're out. Yeah. Um, I've heard a lot of people do that formal religious one and then have their own separate one. Um, this one onto the next one is um, the artist is Christian, and this one is the creation of the world and the expulsion from paradise. Um, and when I was reading up on this piece, the artist was influenced by Dante and the Inferno, which I thought was very interesting. Um, and um, yeah, I don't know. I really like this piece. Does anybody have anything to say about it? I'm guessing that the third figure pushing them out is a, is supposed to be a chair beam, but I don't mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. uh, flaming wings probably because of the flaming swords, I assume, but I don't know that for sure. And is that different, what you're seeing here, is that different from what you, your interpretation of what you've read in the Bible of this part? Yeah. 
yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That, that's that's a whole different conversation though. <laughs> <laughs> kind of, not necessarily. Yeah. Um, that's a that's a kind of Greco-Roman Norse um, interpretation of angel. That's what I would argue. Mm -hmm. uh, it looks very violent. I don't know why. I mean, he was inspired by the Inferno, so. Let's see, I'm gonna check the chat real quick. Does anybody else have anything they wanna say about this piece? Hard for me to see what's at the very bottom. Are those serpents or what are those at the bottom? <laughs> they do not stay on um, on the Mets uh, website. They they did not say what those were. Bet you they are though. Mm -hmm. They're on the ground and they are looking at their feet. There's yep. the quote about um, the serpent will bite at Eve's heels and Eve's children's heels. Yeah, I am trying to look, and it doesn't look like there's a serpent depicted um, above. Well, they might be above ground right now, but they might also be below ground. But it doesn't look like there's a serpent in um, in the trees or anything. Yeah. Those are not fig trees. <laughs> those are not fig trees um this artist uh, i believe was like born in greece or was born in italy and then moved to greece so jeremy what you were saying about greco-romans spot on um and then another one this is probably yeah. one of the first sculptures that i really learned about when i was in high school um, in art class and Rodin, The Gates of Hell, many of his um, other famous sculptures are within this. So here's a picture of the thinker that is at the top of the doors of the Gates of Hell. Um, and once again, this was inspired by Dante's Inferno. And Dante's Inferno gives us a lot of the symbolism that a lot of people in general, not necessarily um, all Christians or anything, but like when we think about hell, some of the imagery that comes up for us is from Dante's Inferno and things like this um, gates of hell. Um, so uh, it's a really complicated piece and it's a, quite remarkable that he even got this done in a lifetime. <laughs> And then this one, and if I have to check my notes on this one, so excuse me for that. So they, I, the name probably isn't just the standard, um, but that's what they had listed on the websites from the early 18th century. Um, and this was from the Ottoman Air Empire type. Um, and it actually, is a um, from Shia Islam and around it they have the calligraphy right so they're not um, depicting anything but each piece of the calligraphy has a story to it and so on let me see on one side in the centermost circle is the Shia prayer for veneration of the prophet uh, and then his family through his cousin and son-in-law Ali and his wife Fatima and their sons. And then there's also a protective verse around that. And on the outer side, it honors the 12 Imams with the names of the 12 um, Imam enclosed in the central circle. Um, and so that is a specifically Shia um, symbol, you would not find that um, in a Sunni uh, space because it is depicting the history of um, and protection of uh, the Shia line. Okay. Is that a mirror, Amanda? No, it looks like, I don't know if there's supposed to be that. So normally, right, we talked about the Hamsa and the, the hand of Fatima. 
and it looks like there might have been that middle finger <laughs> was broken off or something because there is a little thing that looks like it was connected to something um but i think it's just it's another amulet that for protection um, yeah and then this one uh is the a depiction of um a muslim pilgrimage to mecca where they meet a hindu brahmin which is a hindu priest um, and this particular artist is from the um, region that's now India and Pakistan. And so he shows the influence of the culture around him at the time with the Hindu priests in there. Um, and you can see the Hindu priests bowing down in the bottom left hand corner. Um, and also I want to point out some depictions of race in this and it appears that the people that are moving and are all lighter skin um, are the Muslims while the Hindu priest tends to have the, is, has the darker skin in the photo or in the picture. Um, once again, symbolism comes into this, has to do with time and place in geopolitical histories. Um, and so uh, I believe Jeremy, you wanted to make a comment about some of this. Oh, just that um, there, there's a lot of important Asian influence, uh, both like within, within the religious traditions of Asia. Um, some of you may have been to the uh, Chinese religion um, uh, interfaith learning. And um, really that the intermingling of both art and religion in particular with Asian art um, is almost indistinguishable at this point. Um, for example, uh, just there's, there's a, a goddess that is in a, um, in a temple in Los Angeles uh, named Mazu. And um, this goddess is, the Chi is a Chinese goddess, but she studied Confucianism according to their traditions. She uh, is a a bodhisattva or a, basically a Buddhist. So she's adopting all those things. And in many, many uh, representations of many Asian deities in particular, you'll see um, a clear overlap, you know, where um, the Chinese uh, god will have um, uh, some Buddhist imagery, some Confucian imagery, um, sometimes even some uh, kind of Hindu imagery. Um, and although we can't go into as much detail about that right now, um, I think I think it's important to keep in mind uh, that that kind of culture exchange um, happens all over the world. And I did just do a little time check and uh, I want to stick to the proposed time. So we're going to go through these last ones a little bit quicker. Um, and this is a stand for a Quran. And once again, um, the use of calligraphy, right? And it's, it's all over this stand, no matter what angle you turn it. Um, this is a vertical um, look at the, the one on the left is vertical and kind of compacted more. And then this is on the bottom of the stand is the one at the bottom but also very beautiful. And, and as Jeremy stated, the ritual and the symbol and the art all go together um, beautifully. And another tile, but instead of um, calligraphy, this was a tile from, um, from a Islamic artists and they are depicting grapevines and grape plants um, and um, grape leaves and I'm assuming that has to do with the use of grape leaves and grapes in in culinary food at that time and now here's for a little bit of a controversial one this is um actually an artist that I just discovered 
um, because I was watching a documentary on TV on Hulu and he is a Hare Krishna um, practitioner. So um, not Christian, Muslim or Jewish, but uses a lot of Jewish and Christian um, imagery within his art. And so this first one is called communion. It's probably a lot more controversial than the other one. Um, but you see, um, he uses the styling of Amer of traditional American tattooing, um, which is, is its own art form. Um, and we could go have our own uh, program about religious tattoos and symbolism there. Um, but I thought that his use of color and, um, picturing Jesus and the Virgin Mary um, was very interesting. The, the wings of probably a cherub um, symbolism around butterflies. I believe it was Cynthia who mentioned butterflies in the chat. Um, and then the second one on the right is Ezekiel's vision. So I think he depicts that one in a way that we um, kind of, read within the text but also in his own way that is really um influenced by his own spiritual belief so i i am i'm interested in what all the symbols that people are seeing in here though <laughs> I yeah. Mean, yeah uh before there's we... a lot <laughs> <laughs> does anyone uh know what the right yeah, picture... the, the one on the right uh, the bottom one are those from the images of the prophet where he describes those uh, um, uh, a special kind of uh, initiation, right? When he becomes a prophet and he talks about wheels that have eyes and their wheel inside a wheel and they rotate so they go in different directions all the time. Um, and you have a Jewish star there. So that's a little bit more Jewish than the other one. Yeah, yeah. The other one, he's pulling more of the Christian elements with Jesus and the Virgin Mary. Um, and then I don't know if that's his spiritual side coming out or if that's his belief in aliens, but... Um, there's something there. Um, Jeremy, do you want to talk about the Ezekiel one um, with the four? Um, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I mean, just to just to add to what Rabbi Azriel said, you know, that part of that vision is that there's um, there's other faces to uh, the cherubim, um, kind of a human-like face, a face of an eagle, ox, and a lion. Um, that all face different directions, um, and in, in addition to those wheels, eyes all over, wings all over. Um, so in some sense, this is one of the more accurate depictions mm -hmm. I've seen of, of Ezekiel's vision. It yeah. is, it's odd, but it's, I think the vision is odd a little bit, you know? Right. If you read the text, the text is odd. <laughs> yeah. 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 The vision is but, initiation right of the prophet. I'm interested in, um, Rabbi, do you see any particular symbolism from the flame on the left being on and the flame on the right being off? Do you see what I'm talking about? Oh, yeah. yeah. Also, the Jewish star is a little bit different. The triangle, one triangle goes down, the other one goes up. Interesting. Yeah. And this, this is actually on the body of, body of someone? No, 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 no. This is one of his um, art pieces that he painted. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. I was worried about the person that has to work. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, uh, no, I, it wouldn't age well either. I can tell you that. Um, <laughs> uh, and then I wanted to show you, but we're really running out of time, was the St. John's Bible, which is a more um, not as a I don't know. I, I think some people probably would think of the last one as a little bit controversial or out there or crazy. Um, but the St. John's Bible, um, we can link you to the Library of Congress has a full thing where you can um, look at the individual pieces. But that, um, if 
last year the Jocelyn had it here and it was absolutely spectacular. It was breathtaking. It's probably one of my favorite pieces, works of art. Um, so Jeremy, I will let you uh, do your announcements. Yeah, and I'm sorry for everyone who, <laughs> who loves to come every month, but um, we do, are taking a two month break, but, um, and I will we'll be sending this out um, with the recap also, but we will be having a, uh, a course uh, taught by myself, Amanda and uh, Paul Williams, who's the department chair of religious studies at University of Nebraska Omaha. Uh, we're going to be uh, basically teaching an introductory class about Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and uh, some of the relationships that they've had. It's a six-week course. Um, I'll send out the information to everybody in the recap email, um, but I do want to keep that in mind. Um, I'll also be uh, uh, sending out the uh, topic for the next Abraham's whiteboard. Yes, uh, so the class does have limited registration, um, but the class is not full yet. So um, as soon as I send it out, you know, uh, the earlier you register, the more likely you'll get in there. Also, we will continue to provide it um, some, uh, at least, I think, twice a year for now, maybe three times a year. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, what was the other thing? Uh, real quick, if you want to continue the conversation about creativity and art and religion, uh, next Thursday at, I believe, seven is when I scheduled it, is my um, crucial conversations around uh, creativity. And so we're going to talk more about our identity and how that creativity is expressed, that religious identity, how we as individuals may express that through art. Um, and so that will be next Thursday. So don't forget to register for that. Thank you, That's Sierra. Actually That's listed at 6.30. 6.30. Thank you. I just signed I... up. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, uh, both. Jeremy, when is that class going to be offered? What are this day and time? It'll, of the be, beginning? it'll be Thursday evenings, um, okay. same time, but for six weeks in a row. Okay. 6.30 to 8 or 8.30, I can't remember. It might be a little bit longer. It is going to have overlap with, so it's going to be offered to students at UNO and to the community.